So yeah, welcome to day two of my streaming, working through the Advent of Cyber 2020 edition from TriHack Me. We uh, previously have gone through all of the web exploitation challenges or days that had web exploitation as the category so far. They might bring some back because they've got another, what, 11 days past the one that they have uh, posted here. Um, but we are now moving into the category of networking, and it sounds like the most recent ones are just uh, special um, and special rooms created by one of the particular people mentioned in the introduction. Dark Star, I know we've seen at least a couple rooms from them in this uh, advent of cyber so far. Um, a couple from Swafox, who's not listed on here, but their name was at least, I think, on the last two uh, days for web exploitation. And then we've got these special ones from John Hammond and Cyber Mentor. And maybe Tiberius will have another one on day 15, something like that. Uh, but for now, we are going to just jump into the... The first networking one. Um, just want to double check everything is looking okay in the inspector. Because uh, I was having some issues with the recording and I had to do some work to finagle my stream settings because it turned out even my local recording was pretty jank uh, from the previous stream. It was recording at 60 FPS. The video that I have is 60 frames per second, but the actual, uh, you know, when it got a new update from the the screen recording that it was doing was like once every couple of seconds, once every 30 seconds sometimes, which is really weird. Um, but I I feel like I've gotten that fixed uh, with the way that I'm doing the recording now. And so hopefully when I post the video from this stream up on YouTube, it won't be so annoying to watch as I talk and you can't see what's changing on the screen or you hear me typing and you can't see anything being typed. All right, all that out of the way. What we're working on is day seven, and this is a networking challenge. The Grinch really did steal Christmas. So let's start off with the story. It's 6 a.m. and Elf McSkitty is clocking in to the best festival company's sock headquarters to begin his watch over TBFC's infrastructure. After logging in, Elf McEager proceeds to read through emails left by Elf McSkitty during the night shift. Um, that, I mean, I know I'm getting like caught up on the story, but I think they mean to say Elf McEager here. So Elf McSkitty is like clocking out basically. So it's a shift change at 6 a.m. So Elf McEager is clocking in and then reading the emails from the night shift. Uh, more automatic scanning alerts. Oh look, another APT group. It feels like it's going to be a long but easy start to the week for Elf McEager. Whilst clearing the backlog of emails, Elf McEager reads the following. Urgent data exfiltration detected on TBFC Web 01. Uh oh, goes Elf McEager. TBFC Web 01? That's Santa's web server. Who has the motive to steal data from there? It's time for the ever vigilant Elf McEager to prove his salt and find out exactly what happened. Unknowingly to Elf McEager, Elf McSkitty made this all up. Fortunately, it isn't a real attack, but a training exercise created ahead of Elf McEager's performance review. Hmm. I mean, I I certainly understand the idea of maybe giving somebody uh, a an exercise that you haven't told them is an exercise. Um, I wouldn't suggest doing it on a server that is used in production because I think, especially if you're concerned, you know, if this is a new person, which I believe they said Elf McEager is. Um, maybe not an intern, but certainly a junior person, and this is part of their training and, and you know, to see if they're uh, progressing in their skills. Uh, 
they might mess something up on the uh, on that production server that could have been avoided if you had written your your or constructed your test scenario to not use the production. Obviously, in a real world scenario, they could also mess something up. That's the case for anybody, obviously. But uh, in a real world scenario, it's because you don't have the choice. <laughs> um, whereas in the you know if you're if you're constructing a test for somebody, you do have the opportunity to do it in a way that's hopefully m more safe, I guess. So maybe a questionable choice there, but uh, since this is all fake, it doesn't doesn't actually matter. All right. Uh, so we're going to learn some basic, uh, stuff about IP and TCP IP. Um, I mean, yeah. So we'll learn about the three-way handshake that TCP uses, which is like, what, SYN, SYNAC, ACK, pretty sure. And a little bit about how to use Wireshark. Uh, and we'll look at some PCAPs for HTTP and SMB traffic, and then there will be a challenge. I am going to deploy the machine, or, oh no, I just have to download the file. Can I, can't get the URL for it, it's gonna, that's fine, I'll just... This day seven. Day seven. And then we'll move. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this way we won't clutter up the folder with whatever files are. There we go. So we have our PCAP files, don't need to deploy a box or anything. Um, as with the web ones, I'm gonna mostly skip through this. Out of the things that are mentioned in this list, uh, SMB is the one that I'm least familiar with, so I might have to go back to that section of the intro material if it comes up that I need to know more about server message block um, in order to finish the challenge. But for right now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through. I love that they, whatever screenshot they get, they took for this still mentions Ethereal. Um, I, a friend of mine on Twitter was did a little tweet about how, <laughs> how to show that you're like an old school hacker, so to speak. Uh, without saying that directly and one of the things was like oh yeah uh i i was running ethereal the other day or something you know being like forgetting that they changed the name of it to wireshark two decades ago or what however long it's been it feels like it's been a very long time at this point all right um so let's open up the first PCAP in Wireshark. I'm pretty sure I have Wireshark installed. Yeah. And it's just going to try hack me. All right. So we're looking for a who starts a ping, an ICMP. Um, let's just filter to ICMP. Okay, so we get the request from 10.11.3.2. Cool. If we only wanted to see HTTP GET requests in our PCAP file, what filter would we use? Can we say HTTP dot method what can we request dot method there we go can we just copy that out and they just use one equals looks like okay um 
Now apply this filter to and to the that pcap file. What is the name of the article that the IP address 10.10.67.199 visited? Okay. So we went to this post. There's a couple. Um, so what we're seeing here is right, like the get slash, and then that page has several associated resources. Uh, these might be like link or I forget the other, like what the exact uh, entries are. There'd be like script tags for these maybe and link tags for the CSS files in the head. Um, there might be an image tag and then they click on a link that takes them to a particular post and it loads more fonts. Also maybe through the CSS something of that nature. And then they go back to the root. Um, maybe they click a link for that. This time it gets the favicon. I don't know why it done on the root, but that's doesn't really matter. Um, so with the get, right, we, we're not going to see the response, but we can go ahead and say, follow HTTP stream. This is a really cool feature of Wireshark where it's like, oh, I know how to sort of match up some of these sequences of packets, including multiple requests, multiple packets from one endpoint of a conversation and then multiple packets from the other endpoint, combine them all together to show you a single stream of conversation. Uh, in this case, it's doing it at the sort of application layer um, or presentation application layer with HTTP, but you could follow an arbitrary TCP connection as well. Uh, and so if you have a bunch of noise, which is almost always the case when you're doing uh, a recording, it depends on, you can do a filter here when you're just looking at it in Wireshark, but you can also do a filter on the recording originally, in which case you won't even record the packets that don't match, match that filter. But I've what I seem to find is often the case is people like to do the filtering afterwards, partly because you don't know necessarily what you're looking for until after. So you want to just record everything, in which, in which case you do end up having a lot of noise and being able to like follow a single stream like this is really handy. Um, so this one is, it's following more of the HTTP stream than I would prefer. <laughs> Um, so let's not look at the entire conversation. Oh, did I end up following the wrong entries? <clears throat> so real quick, um, we could just filter out to the stream as well, and that'll be a little easier maybe than scrolling through. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to show you, so it's red is the request side that's coming from, uh, I guess the packet, like, I don't know if it's always the request side is presented as red, but the first packet that we were looking at when I right clicked on it and said follow uh, was, was a get request because that's what we were filtering on. So in this case, at least, we're seeing the, the request side of this HTTP conversation, the client, the browser, um, in red. So we see this is the whole content. It's got a including this empty line, essentially, uh, is coming through. And then this is the entire response for that first request. And because there's no new line at the end, the data just gets, continues on uh, on that same line because it's just presenting it sort of in ASCII. It's not structuring it um, on a packet by packet basis because that's what the other view is for. So, here we requested a minified JSON or a JavaScript file rather, and we get a bunch of minuscript, minified JavaScript. Then we request the icon.png, and you can see it is a PNG file. It's got the structure, blah, blah, blah. And that can be, you know, also very noisy uh, because the, the binary files for your an image, audio, especially a video, is going to be huge in comparison to the bits of text for the HTML or JavaScript or whatever else, CSS. So let's just filter this out and then we can see all of the requests. Um, yeah, 
I want to get rid of that. Does this give me the whole conversation? You got a 404 in reply to index.json. It's interesting. Um, Cause I think that's what I was looking for when I was looking for, can I undo that? So I thought we went to the root and then we tried to request, um, I'm missing, here we go. Oh, oh, I see, okay. I missed some stuff earlier or maybe I was just looking up here and wasn't looking. So this probably like posts index.json is actually like a more a newer version of trying to get like the RSS feed so it's it's basically some data that the JavaScript will use to present a list of posts on the page maybe like for dynamically updating the content um, but we were getting a 404 response from that so maybe that part's not working doesn't really matter because I think the thing that we care about is this reindeer of the week uh, and in particular, we want the title of it. So let's go ahead and um, let's just follow it. And then I guess we can just see it down here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the title understand it I mean we could have guessed that just from the the slug in the URL but since they were asking for the title it was probably better to go find the content that includes the literal title in the HTML document if we say filter out this stream see in this case we don't end up getting that request which I don't know confuses me a little bit but I'm not gonna worry about it too much because um, I think we can Uh, oh, they do say name of the article, so maybe not title. So maybe it's just reindeer of the week. Okay. Um, and then we're going to look at the next PCAP file, which is FTP traffic, or at least includes some FTP traffic. What password was leaked during the login process? So this is a case where... Uh, if you are using FTP rather than F SFTP, you're going to miss, or sorry, you are going to have your login credentials as well as all of the rest of the content of the stream. So including the data that is being retrieved, um, all of that is going to be provided in plain text uh, it's not encrypted at all so if you want to use if you want it to be secure you need to use something like sftp or ftps i think is also an option they work differently um why can't i type okay uh yeah ftps is the FTP protocol combined with TLS, whereas SFTP is more like doing FTP within an SSH uh, connection. This is what I almost always use, and I, or you might also see the program S, S copy, SCPY, uh, which will copy like a single file or a single directory um, within an SSH connection. Um, so it uses the security that is granted by SSH to achieve being able to have that communication encrypted. Um, but the nice thing is like, if you're logging into a system, if you have shell access to that system, then you also have SFTP access to that system because it just uses the same SSH server to like, it's just another sort of module that's been coded into the SSH server. Uh, and it's probably supported on a, almost every SSH server that's deployed in practice at this point. Whereas SFTP, or sorry, FTPS is pure FTP 
it just uses TLS. And that way it's a lot more like how the email uh, SMTP, is that what it is? I think it's SMTP. Um, yeah. SMTP gets secured by sort of starting a non-encrypted conversation. And then usually the first thing you do is you send a request to sort of upgrade to it. Um, you do a start TLS request effectively, and that upgrades your conversation to be TLS encrypted. Uh, so then you can have that TLS conversation that has the SMTP conversation within it. Um, and I think probably that's akin to how FTPS works. Um, although it may simply start encrypted in the same way that like you effectively start an HTTPS conversation encrypted by, I think the first packet is TLS, like handshake stuff. I don't think you start with a, uh, any sort of unencrypted conversation. So, but in this case, they're using plain FTP and there we go. We can see their password. This is the request that they made pass space plain text password fiasco. And what that, this is what you will come to realize with all these old school protocols that were sort of like their RFCs were created and they were defined back in the late eighties to early nineties. Um, they're, they're almost always going to be a text-based protocol with a kind of command reply um, mode because they were on some level either intended or at least like anticipated the, the potential that somebody would be doing this conversation manually. I can connect manually to an SMTP server and type in the commands to literally like log in and download email. Um, it would probably be really annoying to actually download the email and stuff uh, like that, but um, you could do it and you could do the same thing for FTP. So we can literally just see um, the body of the FTP packet. Like this is all this stuff up here is IP and TCP. And then everything that is the body of the TCP packet is in the FTP protocol and it's just the text. It's just plain text. Uh, so we can go ahead and copy that value. Throw that in there. And what is the name of the protocol that is encrypted? So now there's also an encrypted protocol. Oh, I was typing in here somehow, even though I had switched to a different window. Okay, um, let's see. They're saying there's another, so there's SSH is also happening in this uh, packet capture. All right, and we need to analyze PCAP3 and recover Christmas. What is on Elf McSkitty's wish list? that will be used to replace Elf McEager. Some sort of automated <laughs> junior cybersecurity engineer, security person, security analyst maybe is the term. Um, okay, so we've got a bunch of SSH. That is not gonna help us. Then we get uh, an HTTP request. And we don't have Oh, we do have the host, so tbfc.blog. Okay, and what do we get for the reply? Um, okay, so let's see if it's in here. Christmas.zip. All right, can we copy out the file contents?
this is a thing that I've never actually tried to do uh, before in Wireshark. It's like, oh, there's you know a file that I like to work with locally that's embedded in the network traffic because it was downloaded or uploaded or whatever. Um, VI Elite, hey, how's it going? Welcome to the stream. Um, so, I wonder if they talk about it at all in the documentation. If I should just go look for that. Because I feel like if I just say copy the value of this, it's going to, it might not copy it in a form that I would prefer to have access to use. Um, export objects. Interesting. There we go. That's easy enough. Okay. Sometimes reading the information that they present is, uh, you know, the way to go. They did write it for a reason. And if I can remember what I am doing, the project I'm on. There we go. Rooms. Okay. Nope. It was Christmas. .dip. All right. So let's unzip that. Actually, let's see what's in there. How do we list the files? It's not gonna. Oh, do I need to give a command that's like command list or something? Right, just dash L does it. translates line endings. Just want it to like show me what's in there before I let's say zip list there nope nope god damn it does it have a Really? Oh, because I, I need to be using unzip. <laughs> of course. That's the one that's got dash L. Cool. Uh, okay. Unzip. And I think I can just put that one file name. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, just one rubber ducky. Uh, I assume they mean the USB rubber ducky thing, and that'll replace Elf Mickey. Or that's that's sad. <laughs> but you know, automation, right? It, get, it comes for us all eventually, I guess. Okay, so that was uh, that was not much um, in terms of stuff that I haven't done before in my own purposes of using Wireshark for uh you I mean usually I'm I I've basically never used Wireshark to analyze traffic to find indicators of compromise or malware stuff of a, a you know some particular nature um whatever the kinds of like here's how to use Wireshark for 
cybersecurity purposes. And I think what they make most of the network analysis CTF challenges about, I don't think I've ever used it for that, but I've used it for enough stuff to be able to like tool around and find, you know, and filter out traffic. Like it's useful in development sometimes when you're just doing development of a network based application, um, being able to see the raw network traffic, because if you think, you know what's going on from the application level from looking at your code and what your code says it should be doing and it's not doesn't seem to be doing what it says it is then being able to look at the the underlying packet traffic is uh really helpful in those cases all right day eight which is called what's under the christmas tree the story is after a few months of probation, intern Elf McEager has passed with glowing feedback from Elf McSkitty. During the meeting, Elf McEager asked for more access to the best company, the, sorry, the best festival companies, or TBFCs, internal network, as he wishes to know more about the systems he has sworn to protect. Did they make you swear to, like, in the way that a congressperson or like a police officer would swear to uphold the con the constitution or something i hope not i mean I, you know i would i would agree to protect the systems of the company that i work for but it feels like a bit like it would be maybe too much circumstance and uh pageantry to to swear it or something you know I, I assume they don't make you swear on a Bible. I feel like that's probably an HR violation of some kind. But in any case, Elf McSkitty was reluctant to agree. However, after Elf McEager's heroic actions in recovering Christmas, Elf McSkitty soon thought this was a good idea. Okay, I guess like the, the ask maybe came before the heroic actions and then afterwards they were like, hmm, well maybe this person's showing promise. This elf is showing promise. I guess elves are people too. Uh, this was uncharted territory for Elf McEager. He had no idea how to begin finding out this information for his new responsibilities. Thankfully, TBFC has a wonderful upskill program covering the use of Nmap for Elf McEager to enroll in. Cool. Um, so yeah, I guess we're going to scan some boxes. And we should hit deploy. Should have done that before I started reading. It's gonna I'm gonna be waiting on that deployment to happen, I think. Um, but let's let's continue reading through, and then maybe we'll come back and have to read some of how Nmap works uh, as we wait for the box to be ready. Getting started. Before we begin, we're going to need to deploy two instances: the THM attack box by pressing Start Attack Box. So we're we're skipping that. So I'm just using my local computer and ideally we'll have the tools necessary uh, or I can install them if I'd like. Um, and secondly, the vulnerable instance attached to this task by pressing the deploy button at the top right of this task or day. Okay. And the learning objectives. We're going to be exploring the use of Nmap in our information gathering stage to build a picture of the services running on a remote computer and to understand how these may be useful to use. We'll also be showing how Nmap scans can be detected and blocked by the use of firewalls. Cool. So this one was this room, I guess, uh, within the room. This box within the room was made by CMNatic. Uh, so cool. Thanks to CMNatic um, for, I wonder if they show rooms created. There we go. Oh, uh, there's one on Hydra. I don't know what Blaster, Blaster is. Maybe that's just the name. It's not actually like, because I feel like Hydra might be um, named after the tool that you would learn to use. Yeah, because it's about brute forcing. So they're presumably using online brute forcing rather. Um, but I, Tony the Tiger and Blaster, these are probably just names of the rooms um, and various malware related stuff. So that's cool. So if you're in the position of needing to detect or do incident response stuff on a network, probably 
these ones are useful to you. Yara rules so that you can detect signature like traffic and other activity that meets whatever signatures you set up with Yara. Um, incident response and in, for iPhone or I guess other iOS devices. That sounds interesting. I don't have. Uh, oh, I need to be subscribed again. I haven't done that. Um, but yeah, I don't have any iOS devices, so I don't know how much I could actually even go through that. Um, cool. Okay, so we're just probably going to use Nmap to scan a single machine. Um, what are they showing here? What is this website? PFSense. Okay. Uh, how to like set up your network to detect if somebody is doing an nmap scan and basically block that traffic probably block it in a rather temporary way or a limited way so that like one of the things that you can do is create a very heavy-handed blocking response to anything that looks like it is uh, traffic related to scanning. And what that means is that somebody can actually uh, almost jujitsu like take advantage of the fact that your system is over eager to block and they can trigger it to block legitimate traffic effectively. They might do that by spoofing or by just genuinely having access to the network that they are uh, attempting to get blocked and then scan from that just a little bit enough to trigger your uh, protection systems and then the legitimate traffic that they were hoping to prevent from being able to access the machine to cause presumably a DOS kind of result uh, is, is not able to get through so you want to make sure that your your system is like in addition to detecting a scan without getting a lot of false positives from non-scanning uh, traffic, also blocking it in a way that has the most minimal impact while still preventing that potentially malicious traffic uh, from from actually happening. Although it's, it's said a lot that scanning uh, people's computers scanning IP addresses out there on the internet is not itself inherently malicious activity because it's just attempting to start a conversation with another networked computer. And I mean, certainly the ideal is for that to not be possible to cause any issues, but the reality is that it can. And there are definitely services that, uh, if you ping them just in just the wrong way, they will just crash. They'll just fall over immediately. Uh, and so if you if you genuinely are concerned about the potential impacts of your actions, like scanning systems randomly without any knowledge of what those systems are running, whether or not the people running them are uh, okay with your choice to scan in that way, um, is is morally questionable, let's say, because you don't know what the impacts of that could be. And you can tell yourself that it's really their fault for having a system that is so uh, fragile. But, you know, if I think, uh, what is the thing they say in like social justice context? It's It's basically like, the impact is what matters, not your intention. So if you didn't intend to hurt somebody's network, but you actually did because you decided to scan it, well, unfortunately, what you the impact is the real thing that matters. Uh, so take that into account when you when you decide to take an action or not. All right, done enough rambling. We can actually start on the challenge, hopefully. So. The challenge itself says, deploy and use Nmap to scan the instance attached to this task. Take a note of the IP address to scan and enumerate it for Elf McEager. Optional bonus, as a result of Elf McEager managing to recover Christmas in day seven, the Grinch really did steal Christmas, 
TBFC's website has been restored for all the elves to visit. Can you find it? I hear it's quite the read. You must add such and such to your host file. Okay. So, yeah, because we need it. Uh, one thing that I very briefly mentioned as we were looking at the uh, traffic in Wireshark is when we did some of those get requests to the blog, they had the host, um, what should we call it? The uh, host header. Yeah, yeah, it is. I kept thinking header and then keep thinking, no, that's not right. I don't know where my head is at today. Um, but yeah, we needed, we needed it to say TC, tbfc.blog as the host so that the web server itself could realize which site we were attempting to access. And so we could throw that in our, and that will happen automatically if we set up a DNS record in our etc slash hosts. Um, or, you know, we could just do it manually with curl or something and just force it that way, but probably simpler to edit the host file and then go for it. Uh, ba, ba, ba. So when was snort created? <laughs> That's an interesting, is that going to, are they asking when was the tool created? Or when is there some information that we would get from the Nmap scan that would say snort a uh, snort service is running on this machine? I wouldn't think so. Um, let's just look for snort. And it's created. Do not have an initial release, 1998. All right, that's all they wanted. Um, so it's got three services. If we nmap scan it, it's like that, I think. But only if I spell it right. 80, 3389, and one other one. I have to put them in the right order for the answer. Do do end map scans sometimes take a while. Yeah, it says it might take another twenty minutes. Um, wonder. We could we could make it a crazy scan. I forget how to specify insane. It doesn't in my experience does not bump it up that much because I think the issue is um the the number of hops between my machine here in Thailand and the fact that I'm connected to the European VPN endpoints. I could go back to using the Australian one. I think I ended up using the European one because I was on some box that was broken unless you were using one of the European ones, I think. Um, it's probably been long since been fixed and I just forgot to switch back. Yeah, so it's like only 17 minutes rather than 19 minutes not not a big improvement to go as quickly as possible um what do we think it might be i think it was another four yeah so something in the thousands do you think maybe five thousand Oh, and now it wants, now it thinks it's going to be 20 minutes. Um, so I do dash P. We can specify certain ports. Um, we can do top ports. The first 
1024 most common ports 2222 okay I probably need to reorder it uh, yeah lowest time okay cool um, okay so is that MSWBT server? I feel like this is like generic Windows RPC. Why? I used to provide, oh, it's RDP. Okay. I always like mess up the various Windows, super common Windows network uh, ports for their various services. Um, and an Ethernet IP, I don't know. What this one is about, honestly. Um, yeah. Hmm. Um, this is an interesting, I like this website actually just from the fact that they've got like sources from various places, including uh, malware. So if you're looking for why is this traffic happening on my network, um, you might find that, oh, that's an indicator for some particular malware. Um, hmm. Okay, so they want us to run it with dash PN, capital PN. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like we must have already had to scan it. Um, like if it's gonna determine if the host is up, well, if we got responses for these three, we didn't actually do fingerprinting or anything, but um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the order of these should be switched around. Okay, experiment with different settings. Yeah, we could do fingerprinting, I guess, right? Service version, I think. I think it's gonna try to print out some data that it received in the initial response uh, for the services that actually respond and then try to tell us what version it is from that. So if it were HTTP, it would look for like a server header or something. Um, and, and try to use that to be to help us be more informed about what's going on. And then what's in dash A? OS detection, right? Uh, yeah, so we have Apache HTTPD and SSH is running on 2222. Okay, and then they've got XRDP, so it's a Linux machine that supports RDP, I guess. Um, and we can see it's, I mean, it's going to be an Ubuntu machine. We could probably even figure out what version of Ubuntu it very likely is based on the versions of OpenSSH and Apache that we have, but maybe this will just tell us, uh, maybe it will do that work for us and, and tell us what it thinks the version of Ubuntu is. We'll say we did that. Use nmap to determine the name of the Linux distribution that is running. Uh, well, we know it's Ubuntu, almost certainly, unless they are, obviously they could lie. Uh, they could have services that lie about their version. They could also be not lying, but simply install an Ubuntu version of software on a different distribution of Linux. That's like possible. Um, but yeah, we aren't getting any more specific details really. <laughs> They're willing to give us the host keys in this mode for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't get more specific about which version of Ubuntu 
which release it is. But it does say Ubuntu on multiple of those services. Okay, um, so we can use the scripting engine to retrieve the title of the page that we get when we send a basic get slash, I'm assuming is the request that is sent to uh, sort of fingerprint the HTTP traffic. Um, this is something I haven't actually done with Nmap before. Um, so I've used a scripting engine, well, like pre-made script uh, for, I don't remember the, the purpose. It was mentioned in one of the other boxes and I found it to be useful in a couple of cases. A couple, one of the other rooms on TryHackMe rather. But uh, I have not like written such a script myself. So let's see if, okay, maybe we can just run a script already. Um, I mean, there's one called HTTP title that's already written for us. My recollection is that it was like, maybe it's Lua code, huh? Okay. I was going to say Python, but I guess I, I don't know where I was remembering that from. Um, yeah, you can use it for whatever the heck. Uh, so... I'm gonna say blog, because it does say TBFC's internal blog. It's using that like uh, special apostrophe. Thus, we get the escape code. Um, cool. So, let's. I'm just curious. Um, I think it's QF maybe. QO. QL, that's what it is. Okay. Um, so let's look at what this is. Um, it's been a, I haven't really done much with Lua. So we'll see if there's any anything I can glean from this. It's very similar to other languages that I've worked with, so I'm sure that I could work out what it's doing. Uh, oh, that's um, one way to do that. <laughs> uh, couldn't you specify the match is case insensitive or something? Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it doesn't work that way in Lua. Maybe their regex doesn't support insensitive matching, but it's just it feels a little much to have to um do it that way. And like it's it's definitely a little more restrictive than I think a browser would be because I think you could put white space between the open bracket and the T in title. Um, as well as in here, it's, you know, this is probably, this is fine, but I think there's definitely cases where it might, it might fail. Um, or, you know, maybe there are other ways that it is able to work that out. Uh, but basically we are, we just the API gives us the host, you like IP address and the port that we're working on. And we're using, I think the core HTTP library from Lua in order to just make a request to it. Um, and there might be, you can probably override and say what URL you want to use. Otherwise it'll just be slash. That's cool. Uh, hey Foon, how's it going, man? 
Welcome to the stream. Okay, so if we wanted to write our own end map scripts, we could do that at some point. And then discover more information. What could we do? NTLM info. And there was one that was SSH, right? What am I looking for here? Uh, Do SSH enum algos auth methods. All right. Uh, I am not back in America yet. Probably February or so. Um, that's when all the stuff that I sort of got started for a year here uh, at the beginning of this year is basically over. Um, my visa will be up. My lease for this apartment will be up. So I think that's that's when I will head back. I had a whole, I spent a little while thinking like, oh, it would be interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm a rather tall person. Um, and as a result, flying on a plane without decent leg room is not enjoyable after mm, four hours or so. Um, and so the really long flight across the Pacific would be, I basically just, realize that I need to pay for a more expensive ticket so that I can sit in one of the aisles that has like even you know I don't need first class or anything right but like if I can sit in the window or the um the like emergency exit aisle over the wing area um that's usually pretty good because they for whatever reasons they they need to have more space there I guess so that people can get out in an emergency um, but they've taken to charging more for those and that's like a, a new class between like business and, and coach. So I just need to pay for that more expensive ticket if I go on the really long flight over the Pacific. So I was like, oh, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if I could figure out how to get back to America only taking flights that are like four hours or less, basically. Uh, and it's definitely doable. Yeah, I mean, I think it, flying long hours is probably bad for everybody. My main reason for it being bad is just because, like, my knees get really cramped up. Um, but I'm sure that the all the inconveniences are sufficient that nobody enjoys it. Um, maybe if you're in first class, but even then I doubt it really makes up for it. Uh, I guess if you're on a private jet or something and you can wander around and it's a very different experience, I don't know. That's certainly not <laughs> been available to me, but, uh, yeah, like I thought, oh, it'd be cool if I could figure out how to get to the U S with as many short flights as possible, have to fly over an ocean one way or the other. Right. But the Pacific is much larger than the Atlantic. So maybe I could take a bunch of short flights back across Asia and Europe or North Africa uh, and then get back to the U S and be on the East coast. Um, and it's, you know, at this point in time, because of the whole coronavirus situation, flights are incredibly cheap and like the equivalent price for one of the like stepped up middle tier tickets for a flight from here to Seattle, um, is I can get for that a flight to, two different locations in India, then uh, like Dubai, and then Cairo, and Lebanon, and uh, Istanbul, and you know go to uh, Athens and Rome, 
and then like you know somewhere in Portugal or uh, Spain and then fly to the US and the you know the price of the the tickets is the same obviously it's going to be a lot more because it's a much longer process I'm going to be staying places but it would be that sounded like such a fun way to go back and like visit all like I would love to visit India and uh you know all of those places essentially but it's not really only a couple of them are are like it's possible to get a visa at this point like i i can't go to india basically cuz they aren't allowing people in unless it's a business related thing um and i'm not going to take a um risk that that's going to change in the next couple months it probably isn't so as fun as that sounds i'm not it's not really an option but i i did spend a <laughs> a few days fantasizing about that like going on this whirlwind sort of around half the world in in 30 days kind of thing um yeah the the whole travel thing is just too complicated at this point to try to some of them you can do you can get in you need to have you know a, like paper showing that you took uh that you had a negative test within x number of hours of getting on the flight and all that and so like i could i think egypt is avail you know is is an option to get to but like i'm not going to take a really long flight to go to egypt to then take another really long flight to go to new york or something i think that's that sort of is running counter to my whole like let me just do a bunch of short flights um idea so i'll leave my my imagined world world hopping tour for some other part of my life if i ever am in a position to do that again and i'll just go back to the u.s the normal way <laughs> uh and you know just take a flight and i'll be asleep for most of it hopefully if i can if i can figure out how to fall asleep um and then the other part is like i've got this whole computer that i set up in thailand and i need to figure out how to get that back to the u.s because I paid a bunch of money for it and I don't want to like have to try to either sell parts of it or leave it here. Um, but it turns out to also be more difficult than I thought to try to get it shipped back. Like I was expecting it to be expensive, but I wasn't expecting it to be complicated to figure out how to just ship it back. So I don't know. Lots of stuff to, to try to figure out, but I've got a couple months and I'm going to, going to leave it at that. I think and just, who knows? Maybe it'll uh, work out. Maybe it won't. Um, okay, so we tried an RDP thing. We didn't get any extra info from the RDP part, but we've got info about the supported authentication method. So you could do public key or we could do a password if we tried to log into SSH. So that's neat. So I think we've done our work for that question as well. Okay, so it's two down. We've been going for only an hour, so I think uh, we should continue on and see if we can get through another two in the next hour. Um, and I might leave it at just two hours because I started pretty late today, and I don't want to. I don't want to stay up until like two a.m., three a.m. or something. Uh, Foon says the PC must have been pretty expensive because don't you have GPU pass through? <coughs> yeah, um, I got because of my interest in doing the the GPU pass through uh, setup. What I ended up with was a fairly expensive computer that is underpowered for gaming. If you looked at how what you could get for the same price, if you go on like YouTube and look up you know, uh, Linus tech tips or what's the, what's some of the other ones like gaming nexus gamers nexus or something like those, those channels or various websites where they talk about, you know, here's how, here's what you should be able to get for this price point for a gaming PC in this part of the, of the year, basically, you know, the current standards right mine is way underpowered for that because i've got two different graphics cards that and i just went for like kind of mid-tier graphics cards um because i do want the one to pass through and i didn't have an onboard one because i went with amd um and 
Yeah, so everything's a little underpowered. I was like preferencing more RAM and hard drive and then the two GPUs. So I think in total with the monitors, so I have two 27 inch monitors, I think, 27, 28, something like that. Um, it's like eighteen hundred dollars probably sixteen to eighteen hundred i forget it was priced in bot <laughs> and i don't remember now what the translation was to dollars but you know is it is a decent amount of money um and so i'm going to do everything i possibly can to make sure that i retain the expensive items i'm not gonna bother trying to ship the case or the power supply back to the US. Those are just too heavy and bulky to be worth the cost to bring them along, I'm pretty certain. But if I break everything down, I can definitely get the CPU and the GPUs. Worst case scenario, put them in one of my pieces of luggage and like not bring some of the books that I own that I decided to bring down <laughs> with me and I have not actually read. I don't know why I, did, I thought to myself, "Oh yeah, I'll definitely I'll bring these books and that'll be worth doing." Um, so I might have to leave those if I can't figure out another way to get them back to the U S. Um, but I think my current plan is yes, yeah, strip it down. I have all the original boxes for everything so I can pack it up and make sure that they get, you know, they're, they're going to be safe if they're handled by somebody other than me, right? They're not going to break on the way, but I'm going to see if, uh, the, um, the airline that I'm trying to fly back on has any options for like, Hey, I have an extra box. Um, is this just like, I don't know. I don't know what their limits are on more stuff. That's uh checked baggage basically. Um, I'd rather not buy a piece of luggage to store it all in there. If I could do it in like a nice sturdy cardboard box. And if that's all acceptable to them, then I'm, I'm happy with it. The problem is there's no direct flight, right? So I'm, doing this checked baggage, which is then going to another thing. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Definitely keep this, the SSD. I've got like four, maybe maybe it was six hard drives. <laughs> I don't know. I went kind of overboard on the... I, yeah, I don't know how many hard drives I have at this point. I think it's four um, plus a M.2. Um, and the four hard drives that I have are the big... Uh, the the three and a half inch um like what you call them magnetic ones so they're kind of heavy definitely if i had been thinking ahead about like oh i'm gonna have to ship this back to the u.s i probably would have just sprung for the ssds and the, the difference in price probably would have been made up for and the extra that i might have to spend if i uh am paying for these to be brought back to the u.s but that decision was made a while back, so, oh well. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to just take it along with me on the flight because I am already going back to the US. Um, it might just be a marginal cost to add it on to that process, basically. Um, otherwise, figuring out what UPS or FedEx charge. I looked at the FedEx site and it looks like they might not even have the full services right now they are also kind of limited as a result of covid um so something that i decided to put off until january i think before i dive into making that decision um but yeah that's that that is basically my priority list cpu gpu motherboard ssd gets basically everything I care about in that order because of the the price per ounce so to speak uh of how a computer <laughs> works out um okay so day nine anyone can be Santa the prelude even Santa has been having to adopt the work from home ethic in 2020 and I, I Santa has always worked from home. That's been that's been one of the staple concepts of Santa is that he works from home, but he maybe you could say that he lives at work. <laughs> He's got one of those work lofts, work live loft kind of things where you just go upstairs and then you're at home. 
Um, anyways, to help Santa out, Elf McSkitty and their team created a file server for the best fi- the best festival company. I can never get that right. Uh, TBFC that uses the FTP protocol. However, an attacker was able to hack this new server. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to understand how this hack occurred and to retrace the steps of the attacker. Uh, yeah, feel free to just lurk. I think there's a... I, I checked out the Twitch thing a minute ago and there were a few people. It looks like it's down to just two now, but... Um, yeah. I, I'll just be going through these and feel free to watch along. Um... And I'm going to try to post this on my YouTube channel later. Uh, and, you know, so don't feel like you have to be if, like, if you wanted to fit to like see the whole thing, um, we, you can definitely do that uh, when I post it on YouTube. Okay. So before we begin, we're going to need to deploy. Oh yeah. Let me hit that deploy button. Make sure that everything is, I got to turn the old one, I guess. And then deploy the new one. So many notifications. Uh, okay. And this one is also by CMNatic. So thank you again. And learning objectives. Understand the fundamentals of an FTP file server and some common misconfigurations to ultimately exploit these ourselves to get entry to uh, TBFC-FTP-01. Yeah, it is Hamlet on YouTube, but I think I I need to look into how I can get like a short link because I think my channel is just one of those like randomly generated IDs right now. And I don't know if I can change that. Oh yeah, here we go. Change the URL, or, oh, it just shows me the channel URL. Um, which, like, at least I can copy that for you, but I feel like there used to be a way to get a shortened name-based URL. Mm, I don't know. I'm not going to deal with it right now, I think. Um, so I'll just link this in the chat. There you go. Uh, I posted yesterday's stream as well. So you should be able to watch that. Unfortunately, the, the video quality is weird. It doesn't update the screen, uh, except once every like 20 to 30 seconds for some reason. I don't know what that was about, but I messed around with my recording settings and it seems to be better for this stream so hopefully fingers crossed when it's all done uh, oh yeah thanks for the subscription man <laughs> um and I, i've got all of my old streams like that i downloaded from twitch and i'll be trying to upload those to youtube as well it's just taking the time to like make sure that i have a valid description in there and and it's all like named properly um so they're not all getting uploaded right away but they'll be they'll be up there eventually all right, so we can learn about FTP, um, and we're going to uh, exploit some poor configuration choices, maybe being able to log in anonymously and have access to data that really should only be available to people based on their authentication as a specific user. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's ways to run commands as the FTP server's user, stuff like that. Maybe it's like configured to run as root. Uh, or maybe there's other things that I, I haven't really considered with how to exploit FTP. Okay, so let's just, we'll skip down to the questions as we've been doing with all the other ones and see if we can work it out without reading the material. And if not, we'll go back to the material. Question one. Name the directory on the FTP server that has data accessible by the anonymous user. So, first we want to get that IP address. And then let's just log into the target. Just log in as anonymous. We're going to list the directory. And is it called public? 
So we can, I'm just guessing that because the other ones, their permissions are listed as zero where these are like, everybody has permission. I'm guessing it's showing it in decimal rather than like octal. So it's a little confusing, but, oh, maybe these are the sizes and the, the, cause these are the permissions listed in the sort of ASCII listing, the more intuitive listing. Um, so let's cd into that directory because I do not have read access to the other ones. And then can we cat something? Uh, we can get something though, but I'm going to day eight is it no this is day nine all right so now we'll ftp in and we'll cd to public we'll get backup dot sh we will get and this is a writable directory but the backup to the SH is not writable. We also get shopping list. That TXT, because why not? Right, let's see what's in there. Yeah, they want the Polar Express movie. Okay. Um, So, I'm just like trying to analyze this for any potential vulnerabilities. I don't necessarily see anything obvious right off the bat. We generate a name for the backup file that looks perfectly fine. I feel like you could just do this in one date command by providing the like the format with underscores and stuff, but we'll set that aside. Um, but like, we don't have control over what date outputs. So the name of the file, which comes in here, which isn't quoted. So if there were a way to like insert information into this string and put spaces in it, potentially we could control what this command line looks like. Cause it's not quoted. Um, but I don't think that is something we have any uh, any ability to control. And it's just getting everything from the FTP directory and putting it into tar. It's not using like a shell um, expansion, like a sla like FTP slash star, which would expand out into multiple entries on the command line, in which case we could create a file that had uh, spaces in it in its name in order to um, turn those into uh, what am I saying like into additional commands basically but I also don't think that's possible so I feel like m while this is probably helpful to us in understanding at the very least we know one username right um, we don't necessarily have a way to directly exploit this to run commands on the server is my thinking right now but maybe there's something about the tar command that i am missing um okay and pretty sure we could try to see if we can list stuff in those directories Yeah, so we can we can CD into those directories, but uh, we don't necessarily okay. Um, one thing we could try to do because we had a PCAP file from before, from this first networking uh, 
challenge. And this was the password that I think was used by Elf McEager. Or no, it was Elf McSkitty, I think. So we could see if this is using the same I don't think so. Um, I don't know what the commands are. Oh, okay. Um, no. User. So we know there's at least Elf McEager as a user account on the uh, on the system that we're FTPing into, whether or not that actually means they have an FTP account or like, you know, if the FTP server is set up to allow them to log in, I don't know. Um, just going to try a couple passwords. Uh, what? Reconnect? Is that something? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to try a bunch of passwords. We could probably use Hydra or something to try a bunch of passwords, but uh, it wasn't Christmas. Um, so the next question, what script do you have to execute within this directory? Backup.sh. I mean, maybe we have access to write it and I didn't realize that, but it looked like this was writable by a certain user. What, this is a question I guess that I have, like, cause I am maybe missing something here. Um, Right, it would be user group other, but how do we know who owns that? Can we get more details? Um, See, we can delete it. Okay, we were able to delete it. So that must, I mean, we must have had write access to it for that. So we can write our own backup script, which, um, okay, so. We just need to write our own Vim and just uh, let's just cat it so that it's creating a new file into Um, yeah, it's flag.txt. All right, so then we probably gotta wait like a minute or something because it's presumably being run with a cron job. Um, takes a minute to, yeah. If it doesn't, after a couple minutes, double check that you've set up a netcat listener. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could do a reverse shell. But if we know the name of the flag um, file, then maybe if that reverse shell gets us root access so that we can 
read the file using our netcat listener um then I feel like it should be able to maybe I wrote the script wrong though Stay logged in. Um, oh, and then backup data ridge says slash op slash FTP. Let's just do the same bin bash. Um, Take out public, I guess. Oh, um, I need to make it. Can I do this? myself out from being able to do that now that let me exit and then uh, remove directory no I just want to delete backup data sh and then put back up .sh. But it didn't write it as executable. Is there a way to specify the permissions when you do put? Maybe there's a different way to change permissions. I want to use a GUI. Hmm. Maybe I wasn't supposed to delete the file. And I do yeah because I don't have permission to change it there um, I may need to delete this box and redeploy it then The files are not writable, you get permission denied, but the file is writable. All right, I am going to kill the box, I guess. get a new one and then I will just replace the file 
without having deleted it, and hopefully that will retain the permissions. Uh, if that doesn't, then I don't know what I need to be doing to change the permission so that it has execute on there. But don't have anything to do. Leave that. Yeah. I don't need the notifications. So yeah, what are the FTP commands? So I feel like chmod is more like a presentation of a, F, a core FTP command than it is an actual part of the FTP protocol. Like put is a FTP command, I'm certain. Um, if you were to look at the sequence of commands back and forth, put would be in there. Um, but I don't think chmod is. I think change mode uh, is actually one of them. So See if we have the put. It's like no. It's the reply codes. There we go. So maybe put, it, I, I thought put was like a core FTP command, but I guess not. I guess it is maybe store. Um, or there is retrieve as well. Um, maybe they're written on top of that or, or just like renames of that. really yeah I don't know how the ch mod is intended to work uh, or, or 
rather like uh, you know how it is implemented on top of the FTP. Let's see. Uh, okay, so we have read, write, execute now. Um, okay, and now it's it remains execute even though we have changed the file contents from 341 bytes to 52 bytes so uh, within a minute or so we should have the flag.txt file written into here that's my hope yeah i don't know what uh Extensions, maybe? Like it should have worked by now if it was gonna work. Maybe it's not every minute. Um, or maybe I still have something wrong here. Oh, oh, because I forgot I changed, I took out the public part. There we go. Even you can be Santa. Cool. Um, how long have we got? Okay. Let's let's do one more, and then I think that'll be it for the stream for today. And we will tackle. Hopefully, we can get through at least the next two networking ones. And we're, I mean, we're making pretty good progress to catching up, basically. So I feel good about that. Day 10. Don't be so selfish. Uh -huh. So I was going to say it maybe has something to do with an elf file, but I think that's later. And I think it's just a pun on the word elf. Oh, yeah. And it expired. Okay. Um, fair enough. What? Oh, okay. The best festival company has uh, has since upscaled its IT infrastructure after last year's attack for all the other elves to use, including a VPN server and a few other services. You breathe a sigh of relief. That's it. Me, Elf McGeeger, saved the Christmas of 2020. I can't wait to... But suddenly... A cold shiver runs down your spine, interrupting your monologue, your little internal monologue. You suddenly recall that Elf McSkitty had set up a Samba file server just before the attack occurred. Could this have been hacked too? What about our data? Oh no, quick, find out what usernames may have been leaked and attempt to log in to the server yourself, noting down any vulnerabilities found to report back to Elf McSkitty. All right. So let's hit that deploy button. I'm going to deploy a machine. Um, yeah, I think it has been become confused about the status. So I think there is actually a... Yeah, there we go. I'm going to terminate that one. Deploy this one. Okay. So before we get started, we got to deploy the box. Then today's learning objectives, learn about the basics of network file sharing protocols before getting hands-on with Samba, 
where you will be enumerating TBFC SMB01, a vulnerable Samba server, to gain unauthorized access. I feel like possibly all of these, yeah, all of these networking ones have been by CMnatic. So again, thanks for contributing so much to Advent of Cyber for this year. And this is the FTP one that we just did. Okay. Um, yeah, different file sharing, sort of network file server uh, systems. SMB is the Windows native one. NFS is the Unix Linux native one. But of course, Samba exists, so, and NFS has an implementation for Windows as well. Um, Enum for Linux. Interesting. I've never used this one before. Um, I know that there is. <laughs> There is a way to enumerate on um, just with like SMB client. But I always forget what it is. I think on the previous rooms where I've had to do that, I've ended up just looking it up in whichever tutorial I was first introduced to it in rather than like have that memorized. But this is probably a more useful command. Um, and it's got some features that are useful for Windows 2000, which, who oh boy, it's unfortunate that that's probably still relevant in some cases. And the thing that we're going to use, I'm pretty sure, is share enumeration. So, okay, let's see if I can install this. Enum for Linux, right? Somebody created an AUR package for it. Yes. Um, and Paul Enum. Let's look at all those differences. Oh yeah, so it's maintained by the ArchStrike team. Python script to extract the password policy information from a Windows machine. I, you know, maybe I'll look at the Python code for this because I am genuinely curious how you're able to get that uh, without being authenticated. You'd think that it would not want to present that to you. Uses the impacket library. So, hmm. so DCE RPC is the transport and something called SAMR, SAMR, like a uh, remote. Access to the SAM, Windows, rather. Yeah, Security Account Manager Remote Protocol. So you can just poke remotely at the Security Account Manager for a Windows system and ask it pretty pleased to tell you what the password policy is. 
and be like, oh yeah, you don't need to authenticate for that. That's, you know, just anybody should have that. Hmm, okay. Um, I mean, it's up to Microsoft if that's how they, I mean, you know, ideally that information shouldn't cause, shouldn't be a, a help to an attacker, but I think realistically it does have some value. Um, just, you know, maybe it's not that much value. Cool. Okay. So we're obviously, we're not going to be using that side of things. Um, but yeah, we just download copy from the Git re, GitHub repo and then uh, it's just a it's just a plain Python script, and we install it. And this one's just a Perl script. So cool. Um, sounds good. I mean, I can obviously go look at the contents of their Perl script as well and try to understand it better. Um, but I'm gonna gonna put my trust in the Arch Strike team. And then what is, you know, the impacket library? So this is from Security Auth Corp. Is that related to core security? Or sorry, Secure Auth. Maybe it just spun out. Oh, it's now merged. Okay, in 2017. Um, so maybe it was developed by Secure Auth and the specification up here about it being cores in packet libraries because they now own it. I don't know. Or maybe it was developed by Core and now is just under the management of the Secure Auth team. Um, I don't know either of these companies, to be honest. Oh, we couldn't download it. Well, first off, it should be over HTTPS, or not? That seems fine. What is the issue then? Um, unable to get a local issuer certificate. Interesting. Oh, because it, it probably did try it over HTTPS. No, that seems fine. And then, so what is the? Seems like a legit certificate. It's not self-signed or anything. Um, let's try it one more time. But, oh, because well, it was curl's issue with the uh, URL. Um, do I really need to change the download? did work, right? So then what is curl download something else as well? No. Jesus fucking Christ. All right. Uh, Let's see if it'll work if I go ahead and change the package build. Okay, well, it needs to be 
yes. Uh, okay, let's just install poll enum because I guess that didn't get installed from the other. No, what the hell? Unable to get a local issuer certificate. That's, I guess that's my own server issue, my own computer issue. Uh, I don't know why I'm looking at this. Um, and I could obviously just download the Perl script directly and then run it and that's fine, but it'd be nice to be able to Why do I need well I can I mean I yeah, why do I need these as uh, the CA certs from the curl website? And why has this never once happened in a previous <laughs> installation of a package? Um, is there... Trying to see if there might just be a package that installs the CA thing for me rather than like manually be downloading files and throwing them into user share, whatever. Where did it say? What it doesn't say. Oh, do I? Okay, maybe that is the, why would that be different? Um, maybe it's mentioned in here. Yeah. Oh, it's relatively recent. Um, so, okay, it doesn't, there's no curl specific one in uh, March. Is there a, from 2014? Oh, I don't want ARM though. Uh, okay. What? There we go. I could also install CA certificates Mozilla if I don't have it. Uh, 
But like this one, the core CA certificates has not been updated. Eh, I mean, I, I should have the latest one. I've, I've, it's definitely updated since then. Uh, so where is like, uh, you would think that Gandhi is one of the like major web registrars would have. An ex Oops. Maybe that. Um, but user trusts, I mean, these are not new certificates. So why doesn't it have that? I don't know why I'm letting this be a thing that I like digging into. Let's just see if we can get this one working if it's not installed already. Um, no, we do have that. Oh, but we don't have the latest one. I wonder what changed. Uh, in the most recent one. They have just difference in whatever is in NSS. Um, CA certificates. User trust and which is this one? Uh, does it have an ID on there? Fifty three seventy nine BF. CC. Oh, this the, is the RSC one. Uh, have a signature. Where would the signature? Which column is the signature? Serial number. SHA-256. It's not, not subject key ID. Okay, let's look for the SHA-256. Uh, E793. E793, yes, yeah, so it's this one. So, I mean, I don't need the certificate of folks. Um, wow. What the hell? Very, <laughs> kind of surprising, honestly. Um, And what to do? And they even have all the certificates here. Um, doesn't have user trust doesn't have a user trust unless it's named something else
Yeah, what the hell? Okay, maybe I can set a default preference. Okay. So, I can at least override it for one of these. Um, where does this get installed? Hey, what? Where are these files? Is this going to be a thing that I can link curl to? Certificates. No, it doesn't like that. Um, interesting. Okay, so this is not in the form I think that is necessary for <sighs> whatever. I will get the one from curl. Let's see if that works. setting certificate verify locations. Still doesn't like it. Still doesn't like it. What is the hell? What the hell? All right, let's, let's just, uh, you know, see what we get when we curl this directly. I can't believe this is what I'm spending my time on. Oh, did it move? Oh no, well, obviously, yeah, okay. I need to be doing the HTTP. Um, why didn't, I thought I changed the, oh, is that, is that necessary? Um, See if that helps at all. No. Okay. And show me. Okay, so it's using that CA file. Still says unknown CA. Hmm. 
What show me the Yeah, why do I not have that certificate? Whatever, okay. Um, can we say... the equivalent of dash k with w get no no checks or w get okay Cause it'll just use the local. I should have just said fuck it. All right, cool. Um, do we still have this box around? I can't believe I spent fifteen minutes or whatever it's been on that. Uh, all right, you know, for Linux. Target. Share numerization. Cool. TBFC Santa. I like this. This is a lot more comprehensive than the SMB client based approach. Um, Okay. It's missing a dependency in the Paul enum package. So I should alert them about that, I guess. Might be an optional dependency, but it should be listed. Uh, yeah, should probably send them a message about that. Let's try it again. We won't get that error message. Um, hopefully we won't get the error message. No, we still do. Uh, interesting. Oh, it's probably because I'm using the pyam thing. Uh, so actually, I want to say um. Oh, it was already installed. Okay, so. What do I want to do? Um, Python pip install Python uh, py asm one that'll install it in my local one, I believe. You check it. And I'll install Flask and all those other dependencies. Okay. Um, so now let's try it. We can install the upgrade to pip later.
Okay. Cool. Now we get the policy info. But mostly, I think we care about the fact that this is available. So, you're using EM for Linux. How many users are there? Oh, users. Nope, we got error information for this. Um, great. Do I need to have an SMB conf? Need to install Samba itself. I still don't have SMB conf. What's in the private? supposed to do okay so can use one from their git repo think I care. I'm not actually going to run the server we can see if that helps it to work though it's getting more info than it did before yeah I don't, okay whatever not going to question how how Samba works not that's not really my main concern. And I've already spent way too much time on this challenge going down a rabbit hole. How many shares are there? I think there were four shares. Technically just, technically four, three that are disc ones. Okay, four. So we got the IPC one. Um. What share doesn't require a password? I'm going to go with TBFC Santa. And then we can look in there. Um, yeah, it's just going through. I'm enumerating users, I guess. gonna stop it there okay fine Hi Santa, I decided to put all of your favorite jingles onto this share, allowing you to access it from anywhere you like. So what was the question? Oh, th who they left, what they left for Santa. Okay. I thought it was that directory, but I wasn't sure. Jingle tunes. Cool. Okay, so that one was just enumerate the share and log in. That's a good one. Um, but I did spend a not worth it amount of time trying to figure out why, why this one server's SSL certificate, which is trusted by my browser, so is definitely in the list of, you know, certificates 
that is whatever list is checked by Firefox is not the same list that is checked by curl and why is that different and uh, yeah I'm not gonna worry about it as long as it doesn't stop me from doing other stuff I guess um, so on the next stream we will continue on with the networking ones and hopefully get past these and into the special rooms or the special boxes on those days uh, and the next one is the rogue gnome so look forward to that i guess uh thank you to everybody that stopped by to chat and uh just to view the stream i really appreciate it and i'll see you on the next one